welcome to another my T and D marriage video. Cheating. It's been on my mind a lot lately. Not in the way that you think. <laughs> Just in regards to how it plays out in these relationships. So, when I was younger, late teens, early 20s, I could not understand for the life of me why anybody cheated. I used to think, mate, if you don't like your relationship, what are you doing in it? <laughs> Just get out. It used to also feel strange to me that when cheaters were sprung, they'd be all like, please take me back, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, really? You didn't like your relationship enough to stay faithful but suddenly you want them to stay like what or on the flip side when cheaters cheat and then their partners cheat and then the cheater is all incredulous and how dare you cheat on me when they were cheating I just i never understood the world of cheating i used to kind of watch it play out in movies and things mostly because it wasn't necessarily occurring in my real life and I just couldn't understand it. It just made no sense to me. I mean, I saw it play out in like, you know, famous people. Like Beyonce, whose partner cheated on her and she stayed and stuff like that. So you kind of see it playing out and wonder, you know, the whys and wheres, fors behind it. And then I get in this relationship and, hmm. I don't know how soon into the relationship but very very soon into the relationship I started wishing <laughs> that I would meet someone who could take me away from the BS and granted I could have left myself I'm not saying I needed to be saved per se but it just had this sort of mindset of wanting to meet somebody better, nicer. And so I would fantasize, I would drive to work. It used to take me about an hour to get to work. And I would drive to work and have these random daydreams. No, no laughing. That <laughs> uh, I was like at the supermarket, I'm carrying my bags of groceries out and I dropped the oranges and they're rolling everywhere. And some handsome guy comes up to me and hands me an orange and says, is this yours? And then helps me pick the rest of them up. And it's love at first sight. And I'm swept away and woo, I can go off and live with this dude. Very early on in the relationship, I started fantasizing about things like that. Because no sooner had I moved in with him that I was longing for certain things. My ex before him would lie in bed and talk with me for hours. He would casually, I don't know, stroke my arm, rub my shoulders, touch me in certain ways like brush my hair, rub my feet that weren't sexual. He just did them because we would have water fights, we would play games, we would talk, we would go for walks, we would do all of these really sweet, fun, intimate things that were instantly absent when I moved in with my husband who's on the spectrum. Back then he was just my boyfriend. And I didn't understand why they were missing. I just thought that he wasn't trying or that I was being too irritating because that's what he was telling me as I was being too irritating so I'm trying to tone down my personality I'm trying to do all these things to make that happen and not understanding it and no matter what I did it didn't exist it wasn't there and it's a strange thing about a human condition especially somebody who's neurotypical you just miss that stuff. You long for it. You crave it. You know that it's meant to happen and it isn't. And there's this obvious void. Whereas people on the spectrum, they don't seem to even want it, let alone know that it's missing or believe the NT when the NT says it's missing. 
So right from the get-go, I knew that was gone and I didn't like it and I felt sad and depressed. But on the flip side, the boyfriend who was all that, he was a nomad, he was a traveller, hence why we broke up because he left the country. He was just travelling. He didn't have a job. He had part-time jobs whenever he went and stayed in certain countries because he had a working visa. But he didn't have a car, he didn't have a house, didn't have a career yet. We were only young. <laughs> but he didn't have any of those sort of stabilities. And that's why that relationship ended, but also why I liked my neurotypical boyfriend. Sorry, my neurodiverse boyfriend. When I met him, he had all that. The house and the career and the stability. And they were the things that attracted me to him. And ethically, he's a kind person. He's not, um, you know, like racist or bigoted and things like that. So I liked that about him. So... He had things going for him that drew me to him. But as for the affection and attention side of things, that was totally absent. So I found myself in this situation where, where I really liked what I had with him on certain levels. He's a very handy man, a very practical man. He cooked, he cleaned, he looked after himself, he wasn't rude to people, he was good to his family and decent to his friends slash acquaintances. So he wasn't this awful person but there was this void and I found myself wanting to fill that void and for the first time in my life <laughs> I found myself wanting him and a lover on the side and all of a sudden I'm in this frame of mind of oh <laughs> that's why people cheat there's something missing that they're wanting that they're not getting from their partners and before that in my early days when I thought of cheating I used to think well just tell your partner what you want <laughs> Ask and you shall receive. <laughs> yeah, it was never that simple with my husband who was on the spectrum. It didn't matter how you asked, it didn't matter how you talked about it, it didn't matter what you showed or what you did. <laughs> you were not getting it. You could talk in 50 different languages and you were not getting it. And I still, as I said, didn't understand why, but I knew it was missing and I really, really, really wanted it. And it used to really make me angry that I was telling him what I wanted and needed and wasn't getting it. And I used to think, well, if you're not going to provide it, I should go elsewhere. And so that was when I first started to think about cheating. And not to a point that I ever actually physically like sought to. Although, I will admit that, <laughs> and this is kind of so desperate on my part, <laughs> just about every man who entered my life was like, are you the one? Are you the one? Are you the one that's going to be decent that I can, you know, play the field with because I'm not getting this from him, so maybe I'll get it from you? And I'd scope them out, you know, a wedding ring, <laughs> pass. <laughs> Oh, you like pornography? Ooh, pass. You know, I mean, all these things that I was like looking for and actively seeing, would they be decent enough? Would I like them enough to go down that route with them? And it turns out in all of the men that I ever met during my relationship with him, none of them fit the bill. And hence why it never happened. Because had they fit the bill, I couldn't say for sure that I wouldn't have especially in my earlier years where I really craved great sex. <laughs> but it just never eventuated, so it never happened, but I'd always sort of thought about it, and being with him, I understood why people cheat. On the flip side, people on the spectrum generally 
I don't know what the statistics are. A lot of them like pornography because it's sex without the intimacy. There's no foreplay, compliments, arousal. It's just switch a switch, turn it on, there it is, and you can touch yourself while watching. So simple, so easy, no commitment needed. <laughs> and neurotypical partners generally don't work that way, so they will often turn away from their partners to pornography where they get their sexual gratification without having to do any of the work that the neurotypical partner seeks. And then there's also the fact that a lot of them don't necessarily like bodily fluids and kissing and touching and, and being touched feels awful to them and stuff like that. So there's those factors. And then you've got that whole fangirl thing. Mm. And I'm just going to put this out there. I was never really one to say slut shame. You know, if you're a call girl or worker of the night, a lady of the night, whatever you want to call yourself, people who work in the sex industry, I used to think, you do you, right? I mean, ultimately, potentially, not always, but it's their choice. But I'm sort of hearing some of the stories from these girls who have those fans-only things and just think, <laughs> go out and get a real job, really. Don't be so damn scabby <laughs> and trying to scab money out of vulnerable men. So that was a bit left field, I'm sure you're thinking that. But what I'm noticing is people on the spectrum tend to be drawn towards or suck it in towards people of that ilk. But where I get really annoyed with is the way that they scab more money out of these autistic men. I say men because I haven't heard a lot of stories about females. Not that they're not out there, but I'm just going with the men because that's what I've heard of. Where... The girl is not going to be your girlfriend, she's not going to be your friend, she's not going to be your wife, she's not going to be anything to you, but she pretends that you're her friend and she likes you and please give me more money. And they'll use obscure things that they need, like a doctor's bill or something, you know, to con these autistic people into giving them money. And you sort of speak to some of the autistic people who think that there's like a friendship and a relationship there. And I just feel really bad for them because there isn't. These people are scabby. They're just using you for money. And you're sadly, I guess, gullible enough to go there. And that's why I say go out and get a real job. Like I hate to see people taken advantage of like that. That really annoys me. It's not like prostitution in a sense that you go there specifically for sex and you pay her for that sex and then you move away. Although even in those cases there are people who think that their relationships with the prostitute is a friendship. And it's not to say that it couldn't develop into one. It's relatively rare, but you know. So yeah, it seems to be this sort of regular thing that people on the spectrum seek. Fangirls, prostitution, pornography, that sort of thing. Because they probably crave the friendship and the relationship. And chances are in their own marriage things aren't going well because their wife's withdrawing sex or it's not going their way or he wants it, she doesn't, she wants it, he doesn't, you know, this kind of thing. So it's a little bit murky. And so they'll go elsewhere to seek their entertainment. And it's not like, say, in my case, the neurotypical wife. I don't want fanboys or male prostitutes or things like that because I'm craving the intimacy, not the sex. So I'm not going out there and seeking that by way of cheating, whereas somebody on the spectrum is more likely to go out and cheat in that manner. And I do consider that it's cheating, especially if your wife has an issue with it. If you're with somebody and she doesn't care, good on you, you know. 
But if you're with somebody and they do have an issue with that, I think that that would constitute as cheating. And if you're doing it on the sly, <laughs> well, that's definitely cheating. If you can't even be open in your relationship, then that's all sorts of um, not working for you. So in my case, my husband doesn't do those things, and if he did, I would explode. If he had a fan girlfriend, I'd lose my crap. <laughs> Why are you using our hard-earned family money to pay for some girl to show you her cleavage when I have some? I just show you mine for free. <laughs> it would really annoy me that he was using our money for that, or if he was seeing escorts at a thousand dollars a night or something. You know, like there are way better uses for your money than that. Um, and I think spending money in a marriage is meant to be a joint thing. You don't get to just do it whatever you want. Like I don't get to just go out to a male escort and spend a thousand dollars a night without telling my husband. That just feels a bit sneaky. <laughs> and I mean, look, if we both had a joint like agreement, He'll see gigolos, oh sorry, prostitutes, and I'll see gigolos, you know, I guess that's kind of different. We have that agreement, and we have a limit, like you can only spend like 10 grand a year, you know, um, or something. But yeah, to me, it just doesn't feel like something that belongs in a marriage, unless both parties agree. But there are a lot of people on the spectrum who are indulging in this kind of things and it is upsetting their partners for various different reasons. For me, the finance side of things um, and the fact that he might be getting led on, like it would really bother me that if my husband was getting conned and tricked by some woman just trying to scab money from him, I would hate him to be in that position and as for pornography I'd said to him in the early days I'd rather be having sex than watching other people have sex it just doesn't make sense to me and look don't come at me <laughs> if you love porn um, I'm not saying that people who do are wrong and bad <laughs> just from my own experience my own preference I do not understand the concept of watching other people have sex when I could just be having sex. Like why I sit there for an hour or however long it goes for watching somebody else do the funky funky when I could have spent that time doing the funky funky. So yeah, to me it's never had any kind of appeal. I'd rather be doing it for real, you know. Um, it'd be like watching a video of somebody eating ice cream. Uh, I must rather go out and buy an ice cream. <laughs> anyway, so I had that conversation with my husband, then boyfriend, very early on in the relationship and said, um, I don't really get pornography, not really interested in pornography, rather just be doing it than watching it. And he said, yeah, he agreed. That being said, I have also said to him, because on a whole nother level, I find the sex industry problematic. There's lots of, they didn't choose to be there situations. And I don't like the idea of buying into that. Of say, going on a site where something illegal is happening, animals, children, RAPE, and we're watching that and somebody's making money from that. Um, you're making money and getting enjoyment and entertainment from another being's suffering? Yeah, not my cup of tea. So I had said to my husband right from the get-go that I don't want to be going down that road of being in that kind of relationship with somebody when I'm quite opposed to that and he had agreed so again the relationship does has a, have its pros I'm really thankful that he's not the kind of guy that would go against me and do that and I mean he knows to be honest 
that is 100% a deal breaker for me. If I found out that he was doing anything like that, we would be over. And again, just my preference. I'm not saying that if you love pornography and your husband loves pornography and everybody loves pornography that you can't do it. You don't, you know, don't have to follow my lead and you're not wrong and I'm not wrong. We just got a difference of opinion. I did work in or for a company that was anti-sex trafficking. They were trying to stop um, sex trafficking. And I was the data collection and that changes you. <laughs> that changes you. When you realise after doing this data collection how few choose to be there. And those that do are usually doing it because they need money for drugs and stuff, which is not a choice. If you're so poverty stricken that you'll do awful things for money, that's not a choice. That's yeah. And there is really very small amount of percentage of people who actually do choose it, legitimately choose it. And that's surprising for a lot of people to learn. And in fact, most people who learn that don't believe it. <laughs> because unless you were doing what I was doing, you would have no reason to believe it. You're watching it and you're thinking those people there want to be there. Or you're telling yourself they want to be there because it makes you feel better. Or you don't give a flying rat's bum that they're not choosing to be there because you're getting entertainment off it. Good on you. <laughs> but because I worked in that industry and I saw that it wasn't what people think it is, I have been even more opposed to it and do not want to have anything to do with any kind of man who buys into that buys into somebody else's misery for their entertainment. So that's just me, my opinion, my choice. And thankfully I have a husband who agrees with my choice. He understands my passion. It kind of helps too that I would come home and tell him about new statistics I'd learned and he was kind of like, ooh. And because he doesn't watch it, it wasn't a thing that made him feel bad. I think if he was watching pornography and I came home with these data, he'd be like, oh my God, I feel bad. Maybe. But he was never really keen on it anyway. So I guess fundamentally, there's different kinds of cheating in relationships. You've got the ASD people who engage in considerable levels of watching adult entertainment. It's not to say neurotypicals don't as well. But in the case of the neurotypicals and neurodiverse that I've spoken to, a lot of their Aspie husbands are doing it without their wife's blessing. And that's where I think it's really murky. Marriage is meant to be a joint thing. But then I don't know the statistics, and it was, this would be really interesting to know, how many neurotypical partners have affairs on their neurodiverse partners because they're not getting what they want sexually or even emotional affairs where you're getting compliments and attention and admiration. It'd be interesting to find out those statistics, but I never worked in a co company that did that. So yeah, so I guess that's my thoughts on cheating. I feel like doing things behind your partner's back isn't okay. I guess for me, I understand why people might want to stray from their marriages. So you've got the neurotypicals who want a little bit extra than what they're getting. You want the neurodiverse who don't want that sort of intimacy, the ickiness side of the marriage. So I can see how they both kind of work. And in my case, my husband didn't do anything like that. I'd also said early on to him, if you cheat, I'll cheat. And I think that that's just kind of stopped him in his tracks because he doesn't want me to. <laughs> Maybe. have never really asked him. I just said, don't or I will. And then later on I was going, please do because I want to. <laughs> and look, it just never happened. I never met the right guy. I never had the right circumstance. 
Had I? I might have, I don't know. I feel like I would have preferred to have said, look, I'm going to be seeing this other person outside of you to get something that I'm missing. And then that gives him a choice of staying or not. Not sure if I could have done it on the sly. It's not really who I am. <laughs> but in any case, I guess the point of this video is now that I understand sort of the concept of neurodiverse relationships, I get the concept of all the different ways that people cheat and all the different reasons that they do. Hmm. Anyway, if you can relate, comment below. Bit of a sensitive, touchy subject. Maybe you don't want to comment because <laughs> it's putting it out there. Anyway, either way, don't come at me with my anti-porn views. <laughs> I know I'm relatively different in that regard. <laughs> I know it rubs numerous people the wrong way because I have had conversations face to face with people who have attacked me for my views. <laughs> Each to their own. Just putting it out, out, out there. <laughs> anyway, thank you for taking the time to watch this video. I really do appreciate it.